Cops have read it. What has so far been the creepiest call you've ever had to respond to and what happened? I'm not a cop, but my dad just recently shared these stories with me. My grandfather was a cop in a small town in the 60s 70s. Late at night it was common for officers to pull over vehicles driving through town. Especially if they didn't recognize them. He pulls over a busload of people. He walks through and asks them where they are headed. Yada yada. They were headed to California. It was Charles Manson and his group. Another story. Same grandfather. Same stop a car passing through protocol. Asked the driver where he was headed. Bzzzed for a while and told the guy to have a nice evening. Few towns over guy gets pulled over again. Shoots and kills a cop. Apparently he was doing this as he drove along. Get pulled over and shoot the cop. When they questioned him, he said he had been pulled over by my grandfather. But he was such a nice guy he didn't kill him. But he did have the gun sitting in his lap. From a post I made a few weeks ago, I was called out to negotiate with a 17-year-old female who had barricaded herself in a bathroom with multiple knives and scissors she'd done it right too. Swat ended up going through the sheet rock wall. She wouldn't talk with me at all but had multiple graphic conversations with her mother, who committed suicide three years earlier, and her dad, who's serving lots of years in prison for sexually abusing her. When SWAT pulled her out she had completed multiple circumcisions on herself with the scissors, completely cut her nipples off, and had sodomized herself multiple times with multiple steak knives. The kicker was, she was talking the whole time and her tone or volume never changed, the pain never bothered her, or, more likely, she never felt it. The human mind is scary as duck. Not a cop, but answering 9 one, one lines had an open line of a guy yelping ow, in between thud noises. He didn't respond to anything I said. Turns out, those thuds were the sounds of him chopping off his fingers with a meat cleaver. Had a good Samaritan call about a guy pulled up in front of a medical center in his car. He had a travel blender plugged into his vehicle, and he was bleeding heavily. He had chopped his dick off, and put it in the blender. I forget the specifics as to why, but it had something to do with a pending child molestation or rape case. Last but not least, the one that will stick with me, is the woman who called at around 8 in the morning on a Sunday telling me, in an eerily calm voice, that she had killed her baby by bashing his head into the floor because the devil was inside him. I didn't believe her. It was true. Edit I didn't believe her as in, I didn't think she really harmed her children. I stopped a 25 year old Asian male from entering the east executive entrance of the White House. He had slit his wrists and neck prior to his arrival, but not deep enough to hit major blood vessels. He told me that he was a secret agent working for J. Edgar Hoover and that he was 60 years old. He said he had important information to pass to President Obama. I ended up having to detain him, stop the bleeding, and then involuntarily commit him. Turned out to be a local college kid going through some mental health issues. I field interviewed hundreds of White House callers, but this kid took the cake. Got a report of a missing husband. He told his wife and family of six children that he was going to get his tires changed, but never returned. And this was 12 hours ago. They had purchased another house in a neighboring community, and the relationship with the wife was under pressure. So the wife assumed he was staying at the other house and claimed he would never kill himself. The strange thing about this report though was that he emptied his personal bank account into his wife's this morning as well. The wife explained this off saying that they recently had a fight about finances, and he agreed that he was bad at money and maybe they should just have a joint account that she controls. On a hunch, I asked his 14 year old boy if there were any areas in the mountains nearby that his father enjoyed going and the son identified a road about 10 miles away. It was nearing midnight, but I decided to drive to the top of this old and abandoned forest service road. As I drove through the snow and started to climb the road, I felt a gut feeling that I would 100% find this guy up there either thinking about or already acted out a suicide. The snow laid gravel road had some sign of travel, but no real indication of how fresh the vehicle tracks could be. As I reached the top of the road after an hour of travel I was honestly surprised that I did not find his black truck. 
I spent the drive back down thinking about gut feelings, and how they are unreliable, but that I somehow felt different about this one. As I traveled up the road, I did notice over a dozen smaller roads branching off, but they were not mapped, and I had already spent too much time on a single occurrence in a busy city with too few police officers. Nonetheless, I decided to check a single of these secondary roads, and about 3-4 feet of the way down I picked a road at random to check, and sure enough my headlights lit up the back end of a black truck about 100 yards past the first corner. Even if I hadn't memorized the license plate beforehand, I wouldn't have had to run it, it was clearly his. I radioed that I had found the truck, parked my vehicle, and traveled the 20 feet to his truck with my heart beating, like I was doing it at a sprint, rather than a normal walk. What I found inside was a mess of brains and blood caused by a self-inflicted shotgun wound under the chin. I'll save you from the description. There was just something about that gut feeling while traveling this abandoned and quiet mountain road, followed by a sense of being tricked by the gut feeling, then finding out it was true by discovering such a gruesome scene, having to wait 3 hours next to his truck, waiting for body removal, and then to end it all by having to go to the family who was expecting good news to deliver to them the worst news possible. That makes me feel creeped out to this day. I responded to a report of an unresponsive infant. When I arrived, all the family members were standing around casually in the front yard pointing into the house. I found the baby in the back room laying on her back on a bare mattress. I started CPR, but realized the baby was probably already deceased. We rushed her out to the arriving ambulance hoping they had a way to bring her back. I learned she was the mother's second suspicious since death, and I had her other children removed from her care. The difficult part was when I left the scene and went to the emergency room to see what came of the situation. As I walked in and asked where she was, an emergency room nurse walked over to me and handed me the deceased baby swaddled in a blanket and told me to wait for someone to show me to the morgue. So I'm standing there in the emergency room in uniform holding what everyone thinks is a live infant, but rather an infant corpse and several people stop by wanting to see her and commenting on how cute it is to see an officer holding a baby. I just smiled, but it killed me inside. I was ushered back to the morgue after what felt like an eternity and told I had to wait with the baby until the medical examiner arrived. They took the blankets off and laid her on a stainless steel gurney and left me alone with her again. I lounged around the morgue for about an hour waiting. By the time I got home several hours after the end of my shift, because this call came out 15 minutes before the end of my 10 hour shift I laid down on my bed and cried for a long time. My young daughter was in, Dekka, and my wife at work. I really needed to hold both of them. So the house felt incredibly empty. My daughter was only slightly older than the infant. And when I was looking at her earlier, I kept seeing my own daughter. I didn't get any sleep at all before going back in for the next shift later that night. As someone who's worked at a cemetery, burying a baby was my cracking point. I didn't last long after that. I only worked there as a landscape a very small town. I, I was me and the funeral homeowner who worked a 1000 plus plot cemetery when my boss hopped down into the grave and very casually asked me to hand him the casket, which was barely bigger than a microwave. I did so with the image of it being my two year old son. A week later I quit. He understood and we are still friends today. I feel yeah, and thank you for the job you do, that most will never see. One night at about 11.30, this guy jumps off of a bridge into a bay. On the way down, he hits a guardrail and loses both forearms and the top of his head. One set of officers found his arms and set them aside. I was on the dive team. So we go collect his remains. While we check on his condition, we notice the brain is missing. This was me flipping up his scalp and taking a peek inside to find nothing there. It's very strange to look for something very important and not find it. Anyway, we bag him up and get him on the boat. Our supervisor tells us we have to at least look for his brains. Gross. So we dive and look around. But the only thing we find is a piece of skull. And we had decided, if we did find it, none of us wanted to grab it. My dad worked in a precinct with one of highest crime rates in New York City. I think it had the highest murder rate during his years on the job. 
Anyway. He won't tell us stories about what he's seen, because they are mostly horrific and still give him nightmares almost 15 years off the job. However, I do remember he told us one story when he was really drunk. A woman in her 20s walked into her apartment building late from work one night and was waiting for the elevator. It opened, and the only person in there was a creepy looking guy, though apprehensive. She got in and pressed her floor number, but noticed that the basement button was pressed. Normally after 9pm maintenance would lock the basement button to prevent random people from going down there and ducking with shit. I guess someone forgot to lock it. The creepy guy ended up taking her down there, tying her up, and raping and torturing her for hours. He then took her apartment key, went up to the floor she'd pressed when she'd first gotten into the elevator, tried every door until he found hers and took her room and also a woman in her 20s into the basement where he continued torturing and raping both of them until dawn. Maintenance found them that morning. And my dad was a responder. Again. My dad never told us stories. This one might stuck out because he has four daughters. But I think it's gotta be up there in creepy factor. Two adults reported missing parents of two adult children. One male. One female. Alerts are in place for the missing people's credit cards. The father's credit card hits on a purchase at a jewelry store where an engagement ring was purchased. It leads us to the son who made the purchase of the ring. Son is questioned and confessed to killing both parents and burying them in shallow graves. The son led us to the grave site and we began the process of recovery. Both mom and dad had black garbage bags over their heads, being held in place by duct tape around their necks. The sight of the bodies especially their faces, once the bags were removed, and the smell is something I'll never forget. My cousin is a cop and he responded to a call on Valentine's Day night. A 12 year old girl called in, to say her mother had blown her brains out in the living room. I guess her and her brother were getting ready for dinner and the mom just shot herself. He said the creepy thing about it was dinner all set up. Drinks on the table and suddenly she shot herself. Kids were sitting outside when he arrived. To this day I can't imagine Valentine's Day for them, but I know that is something that stuck with him seeing that. Suicide is a strange thing. My grandpa was helping my cousin work on her school project. He got up for a glass of water and dropped the glass in the sink where it broke. He then proceeded to get her stuff up and take her down the street to our aunt's house, dropped her off while acting completely fine, drove back home and shot himself in his bedroom. Edit I didn't realize this would be seen by as many as it has been. We also wondered if there was some condition he didn't tell us about. But, two years before, he killed himself. His youngest daughter died from cancer. She was only 29 at the time. My cousin who he was helping with the project was one of the three kids that she left behind. I was a kid at the time. But I still remember him telling me that sometimes he'd wake up at night hearing my aunt calling his name. I think he just never figured out how to cope. I think one of you said it perfectly. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. My grandma had left town for a couple days to help her sick sister. And in that moment, something broke inside of him. The perfect opportunity was there. We love next door. And I remember trying to break in the door because I was worried about him. His car was there, but he wouldn't answer the door or the phone. Finally. I told my dad, and he ended up kicking the door in and finding him. I think that's the part that people don't think about when they do something like that. Somebody has to find you, and it's going to duck them up. Please, if you're reading this, and you've been thinking about doing something like this, don't. I promise things can get better, even if it seems like it won't. And I promise that there is someone out there who would be crushed, devastated. Who would then go through the same kind of hurt that you were feeling. Just hold on. Detention officer at a local jail here. We had a guy get brought in about 2am one night who we immediately knew was about to give us a fun time based on the way he was moving quickly snapping the head back and forth. Looking all over the room. Etc. One of my coworkers and I stay with the booking officer to help her out when the shit inevitably hits the fan. The guy keeps rambling on throughout the whole process parts of his speech are understandable, but most of it is gibberish. At one point he looks up at my co-worker and says, would you blame me for it? Trying to keep the guy calm, my co-worker tells him, 
No a hole here, man. No one can blame you. For whatever reason this set the guy off. He leaps off the bench and we both push him back down. My co-worker is trying to get handcuffs on his other wrist he was already handcuffed by one hand to the bench and I'm holding him against the wall with every bit of strength I have this methodica was strong. I swear the bench was about to come up off the concrete when he first leapt at us. Once my co-worker gets handcuffs on him, we take a step back, the guy throws his head back, eyes rolled all the way back, and lets out an inhuman scream that I've only heard in movies about demon possession. He then moves his head as if he's looking around the room, but still with his eyes rolled into the back of his head and spouts off more nonsense. I'm not Catholic, but I was very tempted to cross myself. The screaming, head throwing back, and eye rolling continue on for about 45 minutes. Every so often he'd come back to reality and talk to us like a normal person for a moment and then go back into crazy mode. It was a stormy night on the Oregon coast. A lady was driving drunk and ran into the back of a parked school bus. When she did, her car caught on fire, but she was able to escape. When I found her slowly walking down a side street, I was telling her to stop and turn around. When she turned around, her lower jaw was gone, and she was totally dazed. Her tongue was sticking straight out the top of her neck, and she was trying to talk. She ended up surviving, but needed tons of plastic surgery 